coming up on The Whitney Reynolds Show. I want people to see the humanity and the dignity that each of us possess, that we are another kind of diversity. We're another kind of family. The Whitney Reynolds Show is made possible by Yates Protect, a minority-owned business focused on protecting communities and providing solutions to safety problems for public and private institutions, including air purification, metal detectors, thermal detection, and more. Safety is a right, not a privilege. And by O'Connor Law Firm. When it comes to your injuries, we take it seriously. Carrie McCormick, a real estate broker with At Properties. With more than 20 years of experience, she understands the importance of the customer relationship during your real estate journey. Theraderm, committed to developing skin products designed to restore and promote natural beauty. Cyton, because results matter. Additional funding provided by Midwest Moving and Storage, Galileo, The Gumdrop by Delos Therapy. Happy to meet you. Kevin Kelly with Jamison Sotheby's International Realty. Fresh Dental. Ella's Bubbles, 2 School Chicago, High Five Sports Camp, and these funders. We are so glad you are joining us here today. We are meeting guests who have given themselves permission to live authentically. And because of that, their platforms are now elevated. I wasn't a failure. It wasn't my fault. Um, you know, but we've seen great stories of people who overcome some incredible challenges. Uh, every day, you know, we hear about another story of whether it was someone in an accident or someone coming from nothing, you know, and I wasn't trying to be an inspirational story, but what I was trying to do was beat the odds. And instead, I was not going up against the odds, I was going up against the U.S. military. This is an issue if we don't bring forward and keep talking to other people and giving others the courage to come forward, this issue is never going to get resolved. That was a step too far for the military. And so when I reported that in 2018, they, uh, they immediately sent me home and placed me on administrative leave where I remained for the next two years until they ultimately terminated me. I again, will do everything in my power to make sure that nobody feels that degree of loneliness because you still have to get up every morning and put on a face. And just like any kind of trauma, you have to keep going. Welcome to the show. Thank you, thank you for having me. So you've been identified, you've been called a whistleblower. Correct. And this is something that today we are not calling you that. We are calling you our expert because we want to understand the situation and it's happening in our military. Exactly. I really appreciate not being called a whistleblower mm. um, because I think it has this negative connotation to it. And what's happening in our military is just tragic that we have service members that their voices are being stifled. They're being sexually abused and they're being retaliated against at this alarming rate and nobody wants to talk about it. Why is it that no one wants to talk about it? Well, I think that the subject matter of sexual abuse in and of itself is kind of a taboo subject. Mm -hmm. And we don't really wanna believe that people can commit these heinous acts. And so it's just a very hard topic to discuss. How did you get into the realm of advocating for people that have been sexually assaulted in the military? So I started in my career as a child abuse investigator, and then I became a forensic interviewer, and I ran a, a child sexual abuse um, center. And so then I saw in 2012 that the military had uh, made some changes, there were some new laws in place, and that they were reforming their advocacy program. And I thought, well, I'm gonna go advocate for some service members 
I grew up in the military. I have a huge love for the military. The men that raised me were retired colonels and generals, and I just thought everybody acted like my dads and uncles, and um, I got a rude awakening. What was that like when you did see a side of it that maybe you weren't expecting? It was just quite devastating. You know, I see the military with all of this honor and integrity and selfless service. And when people had the courage to come forward to say that they were being sexually abused, whether it was, you know, sexual harassment or all the way to a violent rape, that they weren't being believed, they weren't being protected, and their rights were being violated. Wow. And they had no voice. And I just want to bring it up that you took the position that was actually like you didn't create a position. They had this position there to right. actually advocate for people. Is that right? Right. So I was hired initially as a victim advocate and I've worked as a sexual assault response coordinator and a program manager for a two and a three star command. And again, as a victim advocate here in the Chicago area. And it was just really shocking because the way the system is, you don't have any power as an advocate. What kind of power did you want or would you like to see? Well, when you are going to the person that's in charge of the program and telling them that they're harming people, that the process is harming people, and yet they're your boss, it's counterintuitive. Mm. You know, it's very similar to if a, a woman is being abused by her spouse and that spouse is also abusing the children and the woman has really nowhere to go because they also are in this economic thing, right? So it's just very cyclical. How have you gained your footwork with all this? Well, from my perspective, um, when victims of crimes come to me, that's my job to believe them. It's not my job to judge them and it's my job to ensure their federal victims' crimes rights are intact. Mm. And if that is not in alignment, with what the command's doing, then I'm going to stay on, on the ethical side and uphold those federal victim crime rights. Being assaulted myself as an employee in the military, they told them not to help me because of my status as a whistleblower. Um, so it's just been a whole nightmare of things that have occurred. And so you've experienced this firsthand within the military as well. Mm -hmm. What was that like for you? Here you are supposed to be protecting people or helping them and then it happened to you. I think that defining sexual abuse, whether it's harassment all the way to rape, as an abuse of power is the important thing to understand. Because it's not about sex, it's, it's about abusing your power and controlling that person and shutting them down. Now, have you been shut down? Well, they've attempted to, um, but I, I'm not going to stop using my voice. I'm not gonna stop helping victims, um, I've been, on a suspension, paid suspension from the military, um, November 19th will be two years. Wow. And I've been doing my work through my nonprofit now. And I get two to three phone calls a week of sexual assault victims and domestic violence victims within all service branches mm. that need help. How do you find your strength to keep going? I, I don't know. I just think, I just truly believe that God puts you where you're supposed to be. And that if your voice can help uplift others and these people's names don't get lost. And, you know, we have these beautiful young soldiers that are committing suicide mm. after being sexually assaulted because they're not being protected. And I don't want to hold the hand of another parent that their child has killed themselves because the command failed to protect them after they reported being raped. I mean, there's so many young ladies and, and young men as well. Mm. Um, we can't forget that, that male victimization in the military is also a very real thing. Well, thank you so much for thank coming you. on. Thank you for having me. Our next guest has identified his gift here on earth and is using that to lift others up by his voice. The platform, or in this case, a real life platform stage. And for Dante Bo, this is where he shares stories on life's realities and inspires his listeners to keep going. Yeah, stories about, about a kid being abused in church. Um, they, they tell stories of, you know, my grandparents overcoming and being the first in our family to, to buy land and, and my mom and my dad, you know, 
in their battle with, you know, drug dealing and, and overcoming that. It tells all of these stories. And, and, and I think God had to give me this kind of a voice for the, for my, you know, for the story that I have. <laughs> he is a Christian singer and songwriter that has had his fair share of hardships. During the pandemic, his honest lyrics and unique voice started resonating on a whole new level. I started understanding that it was a superpower and that it connects differently because it has some dirt on it. So people so people feel the dirt, they feel the history. And um, and I started just using it as my advantage and I lean into it more. I, 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 I don't like, I used to try to cover it up and sing differently and stuff. Now I just lean into it and understanding that people are relating to it because it has it has history. He has identified his gift and shares it almost everywhere he goes. There's always more. I, and sometimes it feels like, all right, I'm running on empty. Like there's nothing else. Like I've exhausted every opportunity. I've 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 made the content that I was supposed to make. No one's following me, no one's believing in me, all this stuff. There's always more. And I'm so grateful that when I was going through that patch, my now manager, Taiwan um, in Sydney, they they saw me there. And as friends, we're like, no, you had not done all you can do. Like, there's still more left to you. And um, I'd say that to somebody right now, there's still more left to you. If you're finding yourself in that, that patch, it's not the end. Don't make it the end, I'll say that. Because it's easy to make it the end. Don't make it the end. And what an exciting future to see where this can all take them. I can hear it in the busy New York City streets. And I can hear it in the country, Georgia feels the green. It's something I can't explain, but it makes me want to cry. Sometimes our platforms use pieces from our past to move the dial forward. And our next guest is doing just that with her new movie. Rebecca Hall's recent film, Passing, is based on a 1929 novel. It tells the story of two women who are reacquainted under new pretenses. One is struggling with her racial identity and hiding her true ethnicity from her husband. It was like a compulsion. I couldn't not sit down and write the script. I finished the book and immediately opened my laptop. I wrote the first draft of this movie 13, 14 years ago. The journey of getting from that first draft to screen sort of parallels a huge personal development of my life. <laughs> I mean, um, both sort of professionally and, and personally, and also it ch charts the years that I uncovered a history of passing in my own family. Rebecca hopes this film will speak to all people who feel they need to hide who they truly are. You know, I think the miracle of the book, and I, and I hope comes across in the film, is that there is a universality to it. You know, she transcends the specificity of a story about racial passing and really makes it a story about any of the ways in which all of our personal insides don't match up with our outsides. And I suppose more specifically what I mean by that is the sort of people that we think we have to be versus the people that we actually want to be. Like how much freedom do we have in that negotiation of our own identity? Living your truth. The movie Passing is passing that message on. There are a lot of passing narratives where there's a character who passes and she, you know, essentially the, the story criticizes her for doing it and then she's punished in some way. And I think Nella Larson was taking that idea, but she's not punishing, she's not making a moral judgment about the person passing as much as she is about the society that makes it necessary. What's tragic is everybody else in this society who is not performing, but is stuck and can't speak their truth and can't express themselves clearly. And that is, you know, becomes the critique of the larger society at whole. Like any of these structures, if people are living under these systems of whether it's racism, white supremacy, the patriarchy, or, you know, a world where you can't express your sexuality or gender, or any of these things. Precious is a transgender activist who had a child with her transgender husband. Together, they are using their platform to write a new story for families, one that is breaking barriers and showing that love can prevail against all odds. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Whitney. I'm glad to be here today. Well, your story is powerful across the board and it's become your platform. Tell us a little bit about what makes you, you. I am a proud, 
black trans woman. I am a wife. I am a mother. I am a professional. I am an author of the recently published book, I Have Always Been Me. And I am a person who believes that I leave places better than I found them. And I feel like there's so much diversity in my life that is intersectional. I'm short, I'm left-handed, I'm biracial. <laughs> like all of these things I feel, you know, make my experience so unique. When did you know that you were going to set out on a different type of path? When I was six years old, I was given up by my biological mother and I would see her on supervised visits. And I'll never forget going to see her on a visit and hearing her say that she didn't want me. Oh. I knew that she, she wanted, wanted my sister and that she wanted my brother, but she didn't want me. And I'll never forget leaving that visit, jumping in the back of this car that the social worker had, had picked us up in. And I remember closing and slamming the door. And I remember looking into the sun saying, I'm going to show you that I am going to be the biggest person that you've ever seen and that you'll regret, you know, that I'm not in your life. There was just this inner resilience. As a six-year-old. As a six-year-old. Do you think that moment shaped you into transitioning? I think that that, that moment created a resilience that has lived with me my entire life, you know? And I think, you know, after that I was in foster care and I know lots of foster kids go through that experience because within a matter of minutes, often your life can change and you have to take your life with you. Right. And so I think that that taught me early in life that transition is inevitable. And I think that each of us are always in transition in our lives. And so I, I think that there are facets of that that created who, who I am today. Right. Well, it's interesting because when you were naming off you know, things that describe you, that you don't hear very many black trans women that um, are thriving. And why is that? Because there are so many pervasive stereotypes when it comes to accessing employment, you know, when it comes to accessing housing, there, there are so many systemic barriers mm. in place that prevent trans people from thriving. And I think that is really rooted in the stigma of understanding trans folks. We are, are human beings like everyone else. We have hopes, we have dreams, we have fears. And I think it's about creating opportunity for people. I think when it comes to any kind of diversity, especially marginalized communities, I think we need to be creating opportunity. And I think for so long, the, the doors have been closed, you know, when it comes to opportunity. And I think I've done a lot of kicking and screaming Busting down those doors. Yeah. <laughs> Busting down those doors, you know, to be heard, to be seen. And I think that I, I think that I stand on the shoulders mm -hmm. of so many people within the LGBTQ community who came before me. You know, these great trans women who stood in the face of history and refused to be refused. That is amazing because you're saying I'm going to, you know, blaze a trail here. And with that, you've done beyond just blazing a trail for yourself, you and your husband had a baby. Tell us about that experience. So my husband, Miles Brady Davis, is the love of my life. We've been married for five years and our, our child, she comes out of the love that Miles and I had for each other. And Miles came from a very stable background growing up. You know, I grew up in a very dysfunctional family and I never thought you know, that family would be something, you know, that that I would create on my yeah. own. And once I fell in love with Miles, I knew and he knew that we wanted to start a family together. And Miles is transgender as well. Absolutely. So my husband is also trans. And I think that is one and of the carried the baby. Yes. And I, but I think that is the foundation of our, our story, you know, that two trans people can love each other and that we are worthy of love. And I think the reason that Miles and I share our story is because we want folks to see the humanity of our lives. We're married to each other. We love each other. We can be parents. 
you know, we can be professionals and that we are multiple things. We are brothers, sisters, right? Like all yes. of these multiple things. Um, and yes, Miles carried our child beautifully as a transmasculine person. And I am uh, Zane's mom. And it was such a healing experience uh, going through the process of like being a parent because, you know, I write in my book, I've always been me. I, I went through these, this reoccurring theme of motherlessness mm. in my life. And I never knew of the feelings of what it would be to, to become a mother and yes. to be so nurturing. And, you, and not only did it come full circle, but then like now you are in this place of mothering. Have you gone back to your own mother and said, here I am? Absolutely. So when I was writing my book, I really wanted to understand when I was writing my memoir, I really wanted to understand because I grew up with so much trauma. And one of the reasons I wrote the book was I wanted to break these cycles of intergenerational trauma. And for so many years, I had so much prejudice against her. I had so much anger I held on to it. that I held on to. And I think as I was writing my book, I started to see, you know, what was underneath all of that. And one of the things that I learned uh, when writing is people can give you what they don't have. And she didn't have the capacity because she didn't have that kind of love mm. in her life. She didn't have that to give. Such and a wise statement. Thank you. And that is, that's one of the most things that makes me extremely happy, you know, about writing my book that I, that we now have a relationship because the line, the doors of communication was closed. Mm -hmm. And so we now have a relationship and um, yeah. And she, what fully, is she yeah, I was gonna say, what does she think? And what, it, where does she stand with yeah, you? And, and she, I mean, and she, and my family accepts me. I have an adopted family. I have a, my biological family. And both of my families, most of them, not all of the members of my family, I write about that in my book. You know, one of my grandmothers is extremely outspoken and one of my sisters is, you know, outspoken, you know, about my identity as a trans woman, but that's not about me. That's about them. Mm -hmm. um, but my biological mother is extremely accepting. And I think they've seen this for many years. And what do you want the world to know about you and your husband and your family and the life you've created? I want people to see the humanity and the dignity that each of us possess, that we are another kind of diversity. We're another kind of family. And as long as love is at the center, I think that we are, I think we're doing a beautiful thing. I think we're creating a beautiful future for our daughter and any other children that we, you know, might uh, have uh, in our lives. And you said something before we started taping that I just want to point out because it was beautifully said is sometimes people can change their identity of like their past or I want to change, you know, this for my future. And sometimes people look at trans families or people different. And really, it's, it was a change. I think that we have the right to, to change. And I feel, well, just when it comes to trans identity, in, in particular, folks say, oh no, you can't be that. You can't change, you know, there's just, there's like only one gender. No, this is my experience. This is my, this is, this is my life. In your book, like, I feel like each chapter is like, whoa, here she goes again, here she goes again. <laughs> and with that, what is, go what's upcoming for you? Yeah, so I think next in my life, I think it's continuing a career of, public service. So I see myself, you know, advocating for, for clean water mm. in, in Illinois. Well, I think I want to continue using my voice to speak out for issues that I care about strongly. Oh, I love that. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. Our platforms are ever evolving. Our stories are still being written. And like we say here on the show, that story does matter. Thanks for joining us today.
The Whitney Reynolds Show is made possible by Yates Protect, a minority-owned business focused on protecting communities and providing solutions to safety problems for public and private institutions, including air purification, metal detectors, thermal detection, and more. Safety is a right, not a privilege. And by O'Connor Law Firm. When it comes to your injuries, we take it seriously. Carrie McCormick, a real estate broker with At Properties. With more than 20 years of experience, she understands the importance of the customer relationship during your real estate journey. Theraderm, committed to developing skin products designed to restore and promote natural beauty. Cyton, because results matter. Additional funding provided by Midwest Moving and Storage, Galileo, The Gumdrop by Delos Therapy, happy to meet you. Kevin Kelly with Jamison Sotheby's International Realty, Fresh Dental, Ella's Bubbles, Tutu School Chicago, High Five Sports Camp, and these funders. Go beyond the interview with Whitney Reynolds and her 52-week guide of inspiration. The book goes deeper into the topics you see on The Whitney Reynolds Show. To get your copy for $12.95 plus shipping and handling, go to WhitneyReynolds.com backslash store and use code PBS. For more information on today's program, visit WhitneyReynolds.com or follow us on social media on Twitter at Whitney Reynolds and on Instagram at Whitney underscore Reynolds. Oh!